I have here with me David Prowse, and uh, he is uh, he's the one that plays Darth Vader on the Star Wars uh, series. And I'd like to ask you a few questions, David. All right. Love to. Love to answer. You. First, I want to ask you about your uh, role in Star Wars. Okay, this is Darth Vader. How do you feel as an actor about the top part of Darth Vader? Well, I think it was a, a, a wonderful challenge, really, um, because you know, with with Darth Vader, you're playing the character with no facial expression. Um, the whole thing has to be done on body movements and things like this. So, uh, I think it was a big, big challenge to me. And uh, as, as you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, with the with all the sort of the public accolades and the accolades which have come, you know, since the uh, film has been released, you know, with Star Wars being the biggest film of all time, I obviously think that you know, I sort of <laughs> I met the challenge, as it were. Yeah. Of course, it's, it is helping your career then. Um, mm, well, it helps your career in a, in, a, in a sort of roundabout way, um, in as much that you know I haven't noticed the sort of producers and directors, you know, uh, clamouring at my door to offer me parts. But um, it puts you in a different category as far as the acting profession is concerned. You know, whereas before I was known as a sort of bit part player. Um, you know, now I'm, you know, for want of a better word, you know, in bracket star. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's, as I said, a much different situation, and uh, and the the accolades you get and everything else is is much different to uh, what it was like before. Has it posed any problems for you in acting, or? Uh, not, not in acting, no. But the, the only the only problems I come across actually is um, really trying to get myself over to the public, trying to get the public to realise that, for instance, it is me that's Darth Vader, or it's me that's played the part of Darth Vader. Um, I don't like to say that I am Darth Vader because, uh, you know, Darth Vader is the creation of George Lucas. Uh, I'm just the actor who portrays Darth, or, or or supplies the body, as it were, for uh, you know for the you know for the Darth Vader character. Um, no, it, it, it's. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's been good, you know, since the film has been released. Obviously, it's done so, you know, wonders for me. Um, one of the main things it's done, actually, is, uh, as I said, it's, it's given me a sort of public acclaim. Um, it gets me to and from America a lot because I come over here to address all the science fiction conventions and things like this. And uh, the other thing, the other major thing it's done, um, and this is really something which well, doesn't apply to America at all, but in England, I'm the figurehead of the government's road safety campaign for children. And I think the government, the, the, the campaign has become become that much more successful because all the kids know that um, that the character up on stage talking to them about road safety is not necessarily me or the character that I portray on the screen, on the TV screen, but it's Darth Vader really talking to the kids about road safety, and I think that makes the talks much more interesting. That's You're, you're called the Green Cross Man in that respect. That's and, right, yeah. We have this campaign. In, in England, we have a, a campaign called the Green Cross Code, and it's a code that we, uh, which every child in Great Britain is expected to learn, um, either through their parents or through the teachers or through the police and things like this. The police go into the schools to teach road safety. And um, and I go around as the figurehead of the campaign. I do three television commercials a year, and I go around uh, to talk to all the schools about road safety and to give all the kids a chat and to really find out how much they know. And I said, it's, it's it's amazing because I always finish up uh, having talked about road safety, and then I turn around and say, well, anybody here seen Star Wars? And every hand in the school goes up. Yeah. And then I say, well, uh, you know, did you know I was in it? And everybody shouts out, yeah, you were Darth Vader. You say, and I said, I think it's that it's it's, it's that which makes my talks that much more interesting to the kids and they all queue up after and want Darth Vader's autograph you know rather than the green cross code man which is quite funny of course they pay more attention to you as be being Darth Vader then oh, of course yeah 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 well do you do you enjoy uh, acting in science fiction David um, I haven't done an awful lot of science fiction. I, I've, en I've enjoyed the, the, the two Star Wars movies I, I, I found them you know sort of quite interesting to do. A very hard job to work. I, you know, Darth Vader is not in, 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 you know, an easy part to do um, because of the sort of the deprivations of the cat, of the costume and things like this. Um, but I, I'm not really a great science fiction lover, to be perfectly honest. I, I, I uh, I'm not into science fiction either, either from a, either from a film point of view, uh, or, 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 or even as, as a reading point of view. Um, I must say, actually, that I, a couple of the science, if you can call them science as fiction films, I mean, I obviously love the Star Wars movies, the Star Wars and the Empire Strikes Back. I thought they were fantastic movies. I mean, irrespective of the fact that I was in them, um, I still think they were fantastic movies. Um, I thought Spielberg's uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind was terrific. I enjoyed that. Um, and funny enough, last night, I, I went to see E.T., and I thought, I thought it was marvellous, a marvellous movie. So if you can call those uh, you know, Close Encounters and... Uh, 
and uh, ET science fiction. Yes, I enjoy I enjoy that. But uh, but things like um, I, I I didn't enjoy the the Star Trek movies at all. Um, Black Hole I hated, Battlestar Galactica I hated. I mean things like this. You know, I think they were just very very poor carbon copies of of, of the Star Wars the sagas. I agree with you. What you've done some horror films, haven't you? Can you tell us about those? Well, in in, in 1970, I became the Hammer Monster. Uh, Hammer Hammer was a film which made all the horror films in Great Britain, and they were looking for somebody to uh, to play the monster in one of these one of these films. And uh, I, I, in fact, became the, the Hammer Monster uh, in 1970 in a film called The Horror of Frankenstein. And uh, it has the doubtful distinction of being voted into the ten worst horror films of all time. And I mean worst, worst. I don't mean worst horrific. I mean worst, worst. And then I, subsequently, then I subsequently I went into another horror film called Vampire Circus, which I played a circus strongman who was a uh, sort of vampire type character. And then I went from there into the best one of the lot, which was a thing called... Uh, uh, Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell, which was uh, directed by Terence Fisher, who was sort of the doyen of uh, gothic horror films, and uh, that was a marvelous film to work. It was the first time I worked with Peter Cushing, actually. He was a marvelous person to work with too. But it was a great experience, work, you know, working on that film. I enjoyed. I used to enjoy the monster movies, um, and in fact, I found them much more fun to work on than comedies. I mean, you, you you work on a comedy film, and every you know the the, the lead comedian is frightened to death is to whether any whether he's going to get the laughs and things like this, um, but but in in, in, in in the actual horror films, you know, where everybody's lashing the blood around and things like this, you know, you have so much fun, and it's uh, you know it really is it is it is, it is great fun. What kind? What comedy have you done, Dave? Uh, Carry on, Henry was one I did. Then I did a, we did, we had a series in England called uh, called the Up series, which was a very there's a very famous English comedian called Frankie Howard, and at one time they were they were they were going to try and do a sort of replacement. Um, or at least a, a, a competitive series of films to the Carry On film, films, and, they, and they, they, I think they felt that Frankie Howard was the, you know, was 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 the vehicle to do it with, and they 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 produced a very funny film called At Pompeii, which I had a very small part in. Then they produced the next the next film was a thing called Up the Chastity Belt, of all the of all the of all the names for a film, but it, basically it was a medieval story, and I had one of the leads in it. They gave me one of the leads in the film. And then, the, then, then they, they followed that with another film called Up the Front, um, of all the things. And, uh, and unfortunately, the film that, that was a, it was a really terrible film, and, and the whole series died a death from there on. So that, that that was another comedy film that I was in, another comedy series. Yeah. But they're, as I said, they're, uh, they're they're pleasant to do, but uh, uh, you know you 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 you're you're forever aware. That, um, that you're not supposed to be getting any laughs and things like this. You know, it's the, it's the comedian that's got to get the laughs. Yeah. Well, you know, David, in the first Star Wars movie, they tried to keep your identity a secret. Did they give you any reason, or what was your reaction to that? Um, well, obviously, I hated it. I mean, here I was, having played the, you know, what be what was subsequently to become, you know, the cult figure of the film. Um, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, he was... Uh, you know, a tremendous uh, sort of physical presence in you know, a Darth Vader, and uh, as I said, they, they they really did do everything they possibly could to keep my identity secret. This is not only Lucasfilm, but 20th Century Fox as well. I mean, you could not get any information out of 20th Century Fox um, about myself. Um, no, nobody would give you any information. Nobody would supply you any photographs. Yet they had them all. They had them all there to give away. But nobody. They were trying to preserve the anonymity of Darth Vader. I can understand, um, you know, what they were trying to do, obviously, because uh, you know Darth. Vader is this, uh, as I said, this very, very evil character. And I suppose if I suddenly you know, started, a, you know, going around saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm a really nice guy, really, uh, it might have detracted from, um, you know, from the, you know, from, from, from Darth Vader's performance. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, it was too big an opportunity for me to miss. Uh, you know, here I was in what was basically the biggest film of all time, and um, playing the number one character in the film. I mean, because even Mark Hamill admits that Darth Vader was the, was, was the character from Star Wars. And um, you know he's, he he tells the story. He said he he said he's fed up of going into shops, um, toy shops, and going going to the going to the Star Wars counter and seeing nothing else but shelves full of of, of Luke Skywalkers on the on the counter. He said, and then and, and not one Darth Vader available. <laughs> All the Darth Vaders are sold out, but the Luke Skywalkers are still are still available. So. Uh, uh, so as I said, so it was, it was very frustrating in a way, having, as I said, having done the, done the character and then received no sort of publicity for it. I mean, even even to the extent of, you know, I was well down the credit list and things like this, and uh, um, that I didn't like at all. I, I just felt that, you know, having done the part, they should have, uh, 
Yeah, they should give you due credit for what you do. I agree with you. In fact, I was looking for information about the person who played North Vader myself, and it took me a long time before I ever yeah. saw a picture of you. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, uh, I understand in both of the movies, they only give the actors the parts of the script that they're supposed to do. Is that pretty frustrating for you? Uh, well, in the first movie, we had the whole script. I had the whole script. Um, because obviously, with, with the first movie, nobody knew what we were into, and we didn't know, uh, you know whether we were in a huge success or whether we were in a big, you know, big flop or what. Um, when, it, when it came to the second film, um, they really did become paranoid about secrecy. And, uh, you know, it's, it came right from the very top. I mean, producers, directors, assistant producers, you know, the production assistants and everything else. Um, it was all, everything was sort of very, very highly secret. And, uh, uh, and once again, I can, I, can, I can appreciate their reasons for, for doing it. Because, I mean, you know, I do lots of, for instance, lots of television interviews. Um, and obviously, at, at some stage or other, if I knew all what was going on, I could I could let something slip by mistake. And so I think they feel that you know, if you don't know anything, you know, you're in a better position. If you don't know anything, you can't give anything away. And um, but I still I think um, it just smacks of lack of trust. And um, and I just I, you know I mean I'm a, I'm an adult person the same as everybody else that were on the movie. And I don't I, and I think if you you know if adult persons can't be trusted. Um, you know, then what, what have you got? I mean, it's a yeah. kind of awkward, awkward situation. I mean, the same thing happened on, on uh, you know, the latest film, Revenge of the Jedi. I mean, I only have my pages of the script. And I mean, I, honestly, I have not got any idea as to where my pages of the script fit into the rest of the story. I've got no idea what happens as far as the film before I come into, this, into the movie. I've got no idea what happens, you know, during the course of the movie. I've got no idea about anything about the movie at all, other than the tiny little bits which I've done myself. So even if you wanted to, you couldn't tell us anything no, about it? I couldn't, no, no, no. Well, is no. it frustrating working on it? It's, it's very, very frustrating working that way, yeah. Yeah, because I just, once again, I, do, I, I don't like this um, you know, lack of trust. I don't like this lack of trust. How's, how was morale on the movies, uh, in those two movies, with all the secrets? Oh, morale, morale on the movies is good. It's good, you know, I think, uh, you know, having the first one being such a huge success. I mean, the first one was quite funny because uh, uh, we really didn't know whether we were doing something good or whether we were doing a right or load of rubbish. And there, there were all sorts of problems on the movie, but, but the, the one thing that you could see was that there was millions of dollars being spent. I mean, literally, you know, I mean, sets would go up, which would cost, you know, I mean, to tens of thousands of dollars to you know to put these sets up. They'd film on them for one day and then knock them down. I mean, you know, and then something else would go up in its place. And as I said, you, you know, you, you think to yourself, well, you know, they can't be spending all this much money um, if they don't have some idea that they're on a winner. And as it happened, we were on the biggest winner of all time. Well, that's for sure. Did you enjoy working with Irv Kirshner? Irv Kirshner was a completely different kettle of fish to George. George Lucas. George Lucas was nice to work with, um, but and but gave you complete reign. I mean, you just. I, mean, I always say that George Lucas is very much like Stanley Kubrick to work with, um, in as much that the actors are necessary appendages to the to, you know to the to the movie, as it were. You know, something you've got to have. Um, but he's much more into uh, you know, special effects, and lighting, and sets, decorations, and things like this. You know, all, all that is the is the main. The, the main uh, part of the film and unfortunately is you, you've got to have actors to, to, to help the thing along as it were and Kubrick is exactly the same and uh, but that is it I mean George, George just gave me complete reign you know I mean I never ever had one uh, one sort of iota of um, instruction from George as to how to play Vader um, and yet it was, that was all left to myself you know to, to, to devise and then when Kirshner came on uh, came on the scene he said he said well look he said, he said I just want to place Vader with, with a little more subtlety than there was on the first he said I want I want to play a thinking man Vader rather than the, the sort of the blustery figure that he was in the first picture and so, as I said, Kirshner, and Kirshner was nice because he would come up to you and he would sit down with you and he'd say, now look, Dave, he said, this is the scene we're going to do t today. And he'd say, now, and, and he would give you all the background to the scene and where you, and, and, and everything that was going to happen after. And he'd say things, dafty things like, uh, he said, uh, you know, you've, um, he said, you're, you're, you're going to see the emperor on this scene. He said, uh, he said, you've had a hard day. He said, you didn't sleep very well last night. He said, the wife was on to you. <laughs> like and he'd go into all these little little nuances, like, you know, and, and, and set the scene up for you. So that, as I said, when you actually went into the scene, um, you knew basically everything, everything there was to know. Yeah. So George Lucas really didn't tell you anything. You George, created the character. George told me nothing. George told me nothing. 
you created the character. Right. I mean, Joy didn't even tell me that the part was a mask part until, and I didn't know, I didn't know that I was doing a mask part not until about, oh, well, I went, until, until I went to the theatrical costumiers in London to, uh, to, to have a look at the costume. That's and incredible. They were fully expecting to, uh, you know, just to, to be measured up for a suit. And they said, well, this is the mask you're going to wear all the way through the picture. Because funny, it's quite funny because at the very beginning, you see George Lucas offered me two parts in the film. He's turned around and said, well, how would you like to play? The first part he offered me was Chewbacca. And I, I, I'd gone through a, a whole series of films, uh, all these horror films and all these different things that I'd done, and I decided that I didn't want to play any more mask parts. And then with the first, the first part George asked, asked me to do was Chewbacca, and he said, well, I said, what's Chewbacca? And he said, well, it's like a hairy type gorilla that goes through the film on the side of the goodies. And I said, I said, well, I don't, no, no thanks, George, I don't fancy that very much. The only thing I could think of was I was going to spend three months in a gorilla skin. You know, and, uh, and, and also the, the part was masked, you see. And he said, well, I, I said, what's the other part? And he said, the other part is a character called Darth Vader. And I said, well, what's the, he said, Darth Vader's the big villain of the film. And I said, don't say any more, George, I'll, t I'll, t I'll take the villain's part. And uh, I decided it wasn't until, well, he, said, he said, well, tell me why, why are you taking the villain's part? And I said, well, you know, in my opinion, I said, every film that you ever see, if, when there's a villain and a hero, you always remember the villain. You don't necessarily remember the hero. You, know, you only have to think back on all the Bond films that you've ever seen. And, and I said, you, you remember people like Odd Job, and you remember people like Jaws, and you remember Goldfinger and things like this. I said, but you don't necessarily remember who played Bond. You don't remember whether it was Sean Connery or Roger Moore or George Lazenby. And he said, I think you've made a wise decision because nobody will ever forget this villain. And this is the result. And as I said, but it wasn't until a couple of weeks later that I turned up at Berman's to be measured up for the suit. But they said, well, this is the mask you're going to wear all the way through the picture. Oh, wow. Done it again. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, David, a lot of people feel that uh, The Empire Strikes Back was a better film than the first Star Wars. How do you feel about that? I, I personally thought so, too. I, th I thought it was uh, there was much more to it. It was a, I don't. I mean, I'm not saying it was it was it was better filmed or anything like that. I think I think uh, Star Wars is a very very exciting movie, um, and it had George's style written all over it. But it's uh, but Empire Empire Strikes Back. I just thought was there there was more there was slightly more in it, you know, to to get your teeth into. A lot more character development for sure. Character development, yeah, yeah. And then also on top of all that, I think it um, it sort of ended up. Uh, leaving you in sort of in midair, or you know, wanting to know what happens the next time, so I, which I think was a good idea. Well, in the first one, I don't think they really thought they were going to make a second one. Well, did they? I think that was the whole point. You see, the thing thing was George, George is supposed to have written um, the Star Wars saga in nine episodes, mm -hmm. and when he was uh, when he eventually got the okay to film the first one, um, instead of starting at number one. Um, I don't think he thought that probably number one was strong enough to stand up on its own, and so looked all the way through the nine episodes and. I think he thought that four could stand up on its own, whether it whether it, whether it flopped or whether it was a huge success. Um, in other words, it had a beginning, a middle, and an end. I mean, it ended up with the, with a nice presentation and all that sort of business, and uh, and it could very very well have ended there. You know, if, if 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 people hadn't liked it all that much, or if it wasn't a box office success, it would probably have ended there. Um, but being the huge success it was, he was then committed to follow on. So having started at number four, he was committed to doing number five, which was The Empire Strikes Back. And of course, Empire Strikes Back being the huge success that it was, um, he's committed to doing number six. And the story now is that he's going to go back and do e uh, episodes one, two, three next, and then seven, eight, nine. So, uh, I mean, how many of those I'll figure in, I don't know. I mean, well, how, how, however long that they keep making money, right? Yeah, well, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. But I mean, whether Darth Vader will figure, for instance, in episode one, uh, it might go back too far in time for Darth Vader to figure. Um, and of course, you see, I, I, you know, the, we're not doing the films uh, only every three years. Um, and of course, I'm getting that much older all the time. <laughs> so I mean, they're going to go back in time. By the time they show me, I'm supposed to show me or Darth Vader as a young man. I'm going to be about 67, I think. <laughs> the way things are going. <laughs> they keep doing them every three years. Every three years. Well, are they are they expanding the Darth Vader role as much as you'd like? Um, well, in, in in the latest one, they haven't. Um, not as, not as much as I would like, obviously, but I think I think the the, the, the previous films are going to be uh, are, are going to be the interesting films to do, to find out you know, how Darth Vader really became Darth Vader and um, you know why he's in the mask and all these sorts of things. I think these are going to be the big things. I think everybody's interested in hearing about that. Can you tell me if if do you know if Obi Wan Kenobi is going to be in the new film or if Yoda is going to be in? I can't tell you. It's all it's all so secret. I can't tell you. Okay, you don't know that at all. Okay, all right. Uh, well, they didn't tell me. Let's put it that way. Right, I understand. <laughs> Are they completed the the primary filming right now? Oh yes, all all completed. They they filmed for about uh, 
nearly two or three months in London, and then they went off to, I believe, Yuma, Yuma in the Mexico desert, uh, to film to film some desert scenes, and then they finished up at George Lucas' studio, just outside of uh, San Francisco. Let's see, well, it's been it's been five years since they've done the first one, and uh, you've had a lot of exposure. How is your family uh, reacting to all the uh, all the exposure that you're getting and the fame and that sort of thing? Well, it's quite funny actually. It, it, my, my my children don't take much notice of it, and in fact, they tend to try. They take the take take the rise out of me, take the Mickey out of me over it. Um, I, I've got a boy of seventeen, a boy of fifteen, and a girl of twelve, and they all treat it as a bit of a joke. Like you know, it's like a. Uh, I, I get quite a lot of people come knocking at my door. Uh, I'm in the London telephone book, and I, you know, I'm, I don't try and be—I'm not secret or anything like this. And uh, I get lots of people come knocking at the door asking for autographs, you know. And uh, my, one of my uh, somebody will knock at the door, and my, my, I ask for an autograph, and my boys will come in, and they'll say, they'll say something like, they'll say, "Dad, there's some idiot outside. They want your autograph," <laughs> and, or something, or they'll say, "There's somebody who don't know better. They want your autograph outside." <laughs> And they try to try and put me down all the time, which is which is it's quite, it's quite it's, it's nice. I, I like it that way. I mean, I, I don't want them um, to sort of living in the shadow of Darth Vader and the Green Cross Code man. It's uh, I can understand the situation. It's nice. yeah. and my, my 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 biggest problem is obviously with my wife because uh, uh, my job, you know, my work, it takes me increasingly away from home, and that that's the major problem. Yeah. Uh, you, you're a weightlifter, David, and that was primarily how you made your living uh, before you got to be an actor. How did you uh, get into the acting? You got that slightly wrong, in fact. I was, uh, uh, I was a bodybuilder to start with, and I entered the Miss Universe com competition. And then I, I changed over and went into competitive weightlifting and became British heavyweight weightlifting champion, and I did that for three years. Then I turned professional, um, didn't know really quite what to do with myself, and as, as luck would have it, an offer of a job came up. Um, and I went into acting. I mean, uh, I was, uh, I never ever made my living as a, as a professional weightlifter or anything like this. I, I, my, my living was, um, at that particular time, was as a salesman. I was a sales manager for an American weightlifting company. And um, I, one, of, one of the places I used to sell to was, it was a stunt agency called Tough Guys. And it, they, they had a gymnasium attached. And I, I used to go around to this, this stunt agency and try and sell them vitamin pills and weightlifting equipment and so on. And uh, I went around there one day, and they said, like, you know, they said, if ever there was any work in show business, would you be interested? And I said, well, you know, I've never acted in my life. I've, you know, I've never done any sort of amateur dramatics or anything. I've never had any training. And they said, well, don't worry about that. We'll, we'll cross that hurdle when we come to it, you see. So next thing I know, about two weeks later, I get a call from them saying, could I go to the Mermaid Theatre, which is one of the big West End theatres in London? And they said they have a play there called Don't Let Summer Come. And it's basically a three-hander, um, but they need a fourth character for, for, to play the part of death. And it's a very final scene of the play, you see. And all death has to do is to uh, pick up an actor off the floor and waft him slowly off the stage to make it look as though he's floating off the stage. And so I went round to see them, and uh, they said, well, they said, we're, we're thinking of scrapping the end of the play because what we want, we don't think is possible. We've auditioned lots of actors this week, and uh, <coughs> the, the actor that they have to lift... Um, has been dropped about six times. And so they said, we're thinking of scrapping the end of the play. And I said, well, tell me exactly what you want, and I'll tell you whether it can be done. And they said, well, Kenneth Griffith, who's a very famous Welsh actor, um, will be led on the bed wrapped up in red velvet. And they said, all we need is somebody who will pick him up very, very slowly, and then carry him very slowly off the stage. I said, you'll be covered in head to toe in black. Nobody will see you. You'll be in a black shroud, black gloves, black socks, the whole works. And it, and it will look, with the lighting and everything else, as though he's floating off stage on his own, you see. And uh, so they said, well, can you, can, you, can you show us that you can do it, you see? So I, I went over and picked him up off the bed and said, well, you know, where would you like him, you see? And, uh, and they said, well, that's marvellous, you know, can you do that twice nightly? And that was my very first ever job in acting. And, uh, and it got me my union ticket, which was the big thing. It got me into the actors' union because I was doing a job which an actor couldn't do. And uh, never looked back from there on. I went from there to doing, um, I, I went from there to doing TV commercials after that, and then from TV commercials I got into TV series, and I did a, I did all sorts of things like um, I, I don't know whether these series came over here, but we had things like The Avengers, um, Department S, um, Jason King, The Saint, um, The Beverly Hillbillies came over and did a couple of series in England, which I was in. Um, you know, all, all sorts of t you know, TV series, and then, uh, and then that went on for for about two years before I got offered my very first film, about eighteen months before I got offered my very first film, which was Casino Royale, and I was uh, it was a good you know good baptism for me because I was playing opposite 
uh, Peter Sellers, Ursula Andres, and David Niven. Woody. That was a Woody Allen one. Woody Allen was in that. Funny enough, there's a, there's a nice little uh, story uh, to end that one, actually, because uh, I... <coughs> You know, after, I, after I became Darth Vader, I was in New York on a sort of publicity tour, and I heard that Woody Allen was playing the clarinet in a, in a, in a bar in New York, you see. So I said, well, I, I'd very much like to go and see him. So the people that I was with, you know, took, took me to this place. I think it was called Michael's Pub or something like this. And uh, there it is. Woody Allen's out there playing the clarinet in a, in a jazz group, you see. So uh, I went up to him. I said, uh, I went up to him during the interval. And I said, Woody, I said, I said, you obviously don't know me. Um, I said, I'm, I'm the, the character who plays Darth Vader in Star Wars. And he said, oh, great, you know, nice to see you. I said, but, I said, we did actually work together on a film. I said, we were, we were actually together in, in uh, Casino Royale, you see. And of course, you know, he, he, uh, I never actually worked with him, but, I mean, we were both on the same, you know, film set. Um, but he didn't remember, and you know. But so, but we had a nice little chat, you see. And then I didn't didn't think, think anymore. I went back to this was during the interval, and I went back to my 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 seat and listened to the rest of the show. And uh, at the very end of the show, when everybody was clearing up and all the rest, of it, and I was still there, um, the pianist came up to me and he said, uh, he said, "Excuse me," he said, "I know who you are." He said, "He said I've never ever done this before in my life." He said, "But," he said, uh, "He said, do you think I can have your autograph?" He said, uh, "He said we had Cary Grant in here last week." He said, "I never asked him for his autograph." He said, "But," he said, "I said I can't let Darth Vader go without having his autograph," which I thought was a lovely, 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 lovely honor, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. I've underst- I understand you've written some books. Could you tell us about those, yeah, David? I've two, um, and I've got I've got a couple more in the pipeline. Actually, the first book I wrote was after playing Darth Vader. Um, you see, I'm very much into exercise. I'm a, a great exercise enthusiast, and I have a, my own gymnasium in London. And I'm very much, as I said, into exercise. And so I decided to write a book, which um, which I thought would get. Um, the public to know a bit more about me and also get them to know more about what my ideas on exercise were and so on and so forth. Um, as I said, I have this gymnasium where I coach all sorts of different people from film and television personalities to millionaires to office boys, you know. And, uh, and, but I, and I have my own system of training and the way I train people, which uh, um, is not unique, but, it's, uh, you know, but it, it gets results. And so what I did is I, I wrote this book called Fitness is Fun. And it's all, it's, just, it's me and my wife and the kids all exercising together, um, you know, doing sort of exercises that the family can do together and so on and so forth. And then I take them from, you know, from what I call the beginner stage, which is what I call family fitness, um, into quite serious advanced weight training. And, and it's all, all laid out in a very, very nice book. And, but the book is done sort of one part autobiography and three parts about exercise. And so the autobiography part really, as I said, told everybody all about myself and about how I became an actor and about my career and everything else. And um, it's been quite a good seller. It's, it's, it ticks over quite nicely in England. It's, it will be a book which will be on sale for years to come. Um, and so that, so that was that one. Um, I'd, I'd obviously, I'd love to get it uh, published over here in America because it's, uh, there's a big interest, obviously, over here in, in, in exercising, and obviously a big interest in my career as well. So, um, so I'd like to, I'd like to get the book off the ground over here if I possibly could. And then the second book, I, I followed it up with a book on safety because, I, you know, being the figurehead of the government's road safety campaign, I decided I wanted to write a book on road safety, and. Um, uh, I got so far with the book, and I thought, well, why should I stop at road safety? Why, why, why not go into other things like safety in the home, and safety at sea, and safety on the water, and safety at school, and cycling safety, and things like this? You see, so I, I was, I, I, I had the idea to do it with with famous personalities, and uh, I was working with uh, the two Ronnies. You know, the two Ronnies. You have the, are the two Ronnies on television, Ron, Ronnie Corbett and Ronnie Barker. No, I don't Do think I, I'm not, No, I don't think we have that. No. Um, well, they're very, they're very famous comedian. Morkum and Wise. Do you get Morkum and Wise over here? No, I don't think so. These these people are very, very big and famous comedians in England. And um, you know, Benny Hill. You get Benny. Oh yeah, I'll definitely get Benny Hill. Benny Hill. And uh, I was working with the two runners, and I had this idea where. I, I, I talk to children about road safety. One of the things we say in the road safety campaign is that we, we always say, uh, first find a safe place to cross, then stop. Now, safe places are, are places like, uh, you know, you cross at the traffic lights and you cross at uh, pedestrian crossings and you cross um, footbridges and subways and things like this, you see. But there's, there are various people um, who help children across the road. People like, uh, we have sort of crossing patrol people, like we call them lollipop ladies and lollipop men. And we have traffic wardens and you can cross with the policemen and things like this, you see. So I thought, I, th- I thought to myself, well, it would be a good idea if I could get somebody famous to dress up 
um, as as some characters, some characters, the thing. And uh, we we have uh, traffic wardens in in England. You probably have traffic wardens over here as well, um, who aren't particularly well liked. And uh, and and I got the idea of getting these these two men, the two Ronnies, uh, were very uh, very famous and instantly recognisable comedians, to dress up as two lady traffic wardens. You see, and I said, well, and so I asked them if they would do it, and they said, oh yeah, yeah, great, no, I'd love to do it. So I then approached Morecambe and Wise, who are two the the two biggest comedians in England, and I said, look, you know, I, I need a, a lollipop man and a lollipop lady, which is a, which is really only a, a school crossing patrol. Go, they have a white coat and a big stick with a great sign on the yeah. top saying school crossing patrol, and they agreed. You see, so. Um, so flush with success, we wrote to all sorts of other personalities and said, look, you know, how would you like to get involved in this, this book on safety? And everybody wrote back and said yes. And so we produced this, uh, we produced this rather nice book called Play Safe with the Stars. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a good seller. It's, out, it's on sale now over here. Well, not over here in, in England. Um, and once again, it would be, be super if we could get a similar type book published over here using American personalities. So what are the... That's what I'd like to do. Okay, what are the names of the two books again? Uh, one's called Fitness is Fun, which is published by a firm called W.H. Allen, and it costs about $10. And the other is the others a book called uh, Play Safe with the Stars, and what? that's uh, published by Proteus, and that sells for about uh, $6. So I wanted to get a couple of plugs in there for him. Uh, <laughs> okay, you said you've talked about most of your acting experiences, but I understand that you, uh, you've done some Shakespeare. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> Only one, one, one little bit. Uh, I was uh, the, the, the the TV series, the Shakespeare series on the BBC, uh, got in touch with me and rang me up and said, uh, you know, how would you like to play Charles the Wrestler and As You Like It? And I thought, gosh, I've never played Shakespeare in my life, you know. And uh, but you know, they they um, I went and I did a reading and they they liked what I did and uh, then and then they asked me to choreograph the fight as well, which I did. And uh, we went up to Glam's Castle, which is where the Queen Mother was born, up in Scotland, and filmed the whole thing at Glam's Castle. And it was beautiful. It was a really, really lovely thing. And, and it was quite funny, actually, because normally I have terrible trouble learning dialogue. Um, I, I, have to, I, I sweat over it for days on end, you know, trying, trying to learn just to say goodnight, like, you know. And, uh, but Shakespeare, I learned as easy as pie. I just, it just sort of rattled off. I don't know why, because I, I, I hate Shakespeare. I don't, I don't like Shakespeare at all. But it was a great experience, great experience doing it. So if you, it's been on your public channel, on, uh, on your PBS. Uh, but it's Shakespeare, Shakespeare's As You Like It, with, uh, with Darth Vader playing Charles the Wrestler. Well, I'll be looking for it. David, thanks a lot for being with us here today. I've got one final question for you. Is Darth Vader really Luke Skywalker's father? Uh, well, uh, I think you're going to have to wait for the next film to, uh, to find out. But can, do you, can you see the facial resemblance between me and Luke Skywalker?